Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Judy Singer. I'm the Senior Vice Provost for Faculty Development and Diversity, and I want to thank you all for joining us this afternoon for this event on the faculty search process. Uh, I think we have a very interesting panel of experienced search committee members and chairs. We have a lot of people in the room who themselves have been on many search committees, uh, our department chairs, deans, a lot of people in positions of responsibility. And I just want to start out with my first introduction to the importance of faculty searches. So in the mid-80s, I met Derek Bach for the first time. Um, I was a junior faculty member. I was an assistant professor. And I think I might have been a half an inch taller than I am now, but for those of you who remember Derek Bach, in his heyday, he was like 6'6", six, six, and there was easily a foot and a half between us, as well as other power differentials. And I met him at a cocktail party, and, where, and I'm not even sure what the purpose of the party was. I was just totally tongue-tied. Here I am with the president of Harvard University, and my research collaborator, John Willett, was with me, and he came up with a question to ask Derek Bach. He said, Mr. President, which is what you would call Derek Bach, is it true that you review every tenure case at Harvard University? And he looked down, John wasn't much taller than I am, he looked down on the two of us and he said, I can't imitate his voice, I'll, in a very low bass, well, yes, that's the most important thing I do. I determine the Harvard faculty of the future. And I thought that was such an interesting view from the perspective of the president that in making decisions about tenure, in determining who the Harvard faculty are, that he was really setting the course for Harvard well beyond his own tenure as president. And I think for everybody in this room who's participating in a faculty search, you are carrying that mantle. Part of why you're here is a commitment to doing searches well and also thinking a little bit differently than might have been thought about in the days of Derek Bach's presidency. Uh, the Harvard of the future, we want to be as excellent or more excellent than the Harvard of the past. We also want the Harvard of the future to be more diverse than the Harvard of the past. And one way to get that excellence is to look at that diversity. Just to cite a statistic, in 1970, there were no tenured women in the Faculty of Arts and Sciences at Harvard University. Zero. In 1970, that's right, I was in high school at the time, some people will have been in college. No women were considered acceptable members of the Faculty of Arts and Sciences in 1970. I'm very pleased to say that that has really changed. And I think the commitment of people in this room to putting energy into searches, to thinking a little bit outside the box, to not always say, well, we've always done it this way, uh, which is off, too often a Harvard refrain. So I just want to thank you all for being here uh, and thank you for your efforts in being on a search. How many of you are actually on a committee this year? Yeah, a lot of people, okay. Being on a search is an enormous amount of work and I just want to thank you for that effort and that time. I'm going to conclude my remarks by introducing the moderator for today, uh, Mazarin Banaji, um, our colleague here in the psychology department. She's the Clark Professor of Social Ethics in the Department of Psychology and the senior advisor to the Dean of the Faculty of Arts and Sciences on faculty development. She is also one of the world's leading experts on concepts of implicit bias and implicit association. And when I give talks around the country, around the world on uh, faculty development and diversity, I often say, and I'm going to embarrass Mazarin, that I, I have an unfair advantage by having Mazarin as a colleague and somebody who I can count on to help work with me and with all of you on faculty searches and, and changing the way we do things. I'm also going to shamelessly promote her book. Um, so this is a book that came out last year. It's called Blind Spot. It's a great read. Um, and she'd be happy to autograph it for you. Uh, <laughs> And it gives you some sense about the implicit biases and what she calls mind bugs and blind spots that we all carry with us. And one of the important lessons is, I've got them too. Mazarin's got them. It's human nature. And I think trying to think about how we wrestle those demons and make good decisions in the face of inputs that might send us in different directions is part of what we're here to do today. So with that, let me introduce Mazarin Banaji. Thank you. Uh, 
Uh, thank you, uh, Judy. Um, the only thing I'll add about the book is that its price is falling pre precipitously on Amazon, even as we speak. So it is, it'll be worth pennies if you wait two weeks before you buy it. Um, absolutely, among the most exciting and important things we do is to uh, select people who will become a part of this community and will eventually replace those of us who are uh, in this in this room. For me, one of the great surprises of my professional life was that I made a discovery maybe 30 years ago now that was an unexpected effect in an experiment that became so startling to me that I decided to drop everything else I was doing and focus on it, and it has been uh, the work I've done these last uh, 30 years. But of even greater surprise to me is the fact that anybody outside of my 10 academic colleagues would care about it, but such is the state of this knowledge that people are using it, um, uh, ho hopefully they will use it wisely, but everywhere you go, people want to ask the question, how can I make better decisions about the people I select. And until very recently, there was no science of this. We assumed that as people who have technical expertise in a particular field or work, in, that that's the expertise that will drive the decisions that we will make. I have a certain set of arguments to make for why X is the right candidate. And then of course the science comes along and over a 50 year period, it has produced many, many results that make us really rethink uh, the rationality of those choices. Um, we won't go into the research results today. What we want to hear from is almost the other side of it, real anecdotes, things that people have experienced in the trenches that we can learn from. And as Judy and I were chatting before this session, I said to her that even as a scientist, I'm often surprised at how much the data don't matter to me <laughs> and how much those anecdotes do. It's a shameful thing to say, but, but these stories about um, what people actually encounter in the trenches remain with us and they motivate us to try to do um, better. Let me give you a quick little example of uh, something I experienced in my own department um, as one of those anecdotes and what we did about it uh, with Judy's and, and Nina's um, assistance. So um, we, we ran a search, I think it was about a couple of years ago now, um, in which the field, the base rate, uh, in the field is that 50% of the uh, applications, the junior search, 50% uh, of the applications came from men and 50% from women. And by the way, gender is not by any means the only thing to be worrying about here. This is a very broad landscape where we ought to think about every aspect of a person's category that might in some way lead us uh, to think that they were either the perfect fit for Harvard or does, do not fit at Harvard. Um, so 50-50 is the base rate. Uh, the, the, the committee does due diligence and they come up with the five best people that they want to interview. And they come to me because they've discovered that after their due diligence, what they have are five outstanding male candidates. And they wanted to know what they could do to understand if this was indeed a decision that may have incorporated some bias. I look at the application pool myself. I come up with exactly the same five people they would have. There was nothing I could see wrong in the process, and that's what it was. If that were one year, we would say, anybody who understands the law of small numbers knows that that can easily happen. Uh, but we looked back at our own searches and we discovered that that had been happening in pretty much every one of the last six searches that we had had. And so we had to pause. And I'm gonna urge you that when you come upon data like that, don't just plod forward. Uh, ask why that might happen, even if there is no obvious reason as to why that might be happening. So we did something, the chair of the search, uh, and I'm gonna actually um, sort of give a shout out to people who have been recently tenured at Harvard, because I think that the, the, the baton has been passed to you, and it is extremely important that you play a role in raising issues that your predecessors may not have, because you are younger, and as a result, you know this evidence better. It was taught to you perhaps in a class, which is not true for people my age. So the person who chaired the search and who knew about this research came to me and said, I, I, can't, I can't go forward, he said, given what we're seeing as the base rates and then our, our selections. So he did something very interesting. He wrote an email to junior people in the field, including in our own department, and said, we're doing a search in X field. Who are the candidates that come to your mind who you think ought to be people we should think about? Six names came to us repeatedly as the best people in the field, and they all happened to be names of women. Not one of those six women was in our pool. So why would that happen? Why would a junior person 
who clearly belongs in the top 5% of our pool, not be in the pool. At that point, we talked uh, to Nina, to, to Judy, and asked for permission to call these women and ask them, why did you not apply <laughs> to the job at Harvard? And to a T, the answer was, I didn't think I belonged at Harvard. I didn't, I, your advertisement read, seeking exceptional candidates in blah, blah, blah field, and I don't think of myself as exceptional. Mind you, this from a person who had applied to a similar position at Princeton and at Stanford. Okay? So I'm here to tell you that there are many ways for us to think about not just selection, but even recruitment. I give you the example of this kid, the 16-year-old Mongolian kid that MIT brought from Mongolia. This is a kid who lives in a semi-nomadic -nomad, group, uh, manages to find access to the internet for a few hours a day, and ended up scoring so high in a MOOC that MIT uh, teaches, uh, anchoring sort of the high end of the 150,000 people who take this course, that eventually they sort of sent you know, an administrator or a dean to Mongolia, they packed up his bags and they brought him to MIT. I would say that's recruiting, okay? <laughs> and, and I would like us to do something similar. Just yesterday, we were having a discussion when it, you know, it struck us that somebody had been discussed at Harvard, but we didn't really follow through, and now it turns out that she is the leader in a field that we maybe should have thought about. These are no longer little offenses or mistakes. This is, this is tragic if we can't bring the very best people here. So today, the job is to think only about one area, selection, even though there are many parts to this problem, and for us to begin with three people, all of whom have shown amazing commitment, in my opinion, to to uh, improving uh, the integrity of the process that we uh, employ. I'll begin by introducing our first panelist, Iris Bonet. Uh, Iris is a professor of public policy at the Kennedy School of Government. She's also the director of the Women in Public Policy program, and she serves as one of, uh, serves as Kennedy School's uh, academic dean. Um, Iris's training is that of a behavioral economist, which means that she doesn't just have models of how humans might behave. She actually does some experiments and shows us how uh, economic theories may be right or wrong. Uh, she studies mostly things like trust uh, in decision making, but using gender as one of her variables, and has been interested in this method that has been labeled nudges. Um, the idea is to, so, so psychologists like myself, we think about individual minds and how can we change a mind to go from incorrect decision making to correct decision making. But Iris doesn't worry about individuals. She thinks they're a lost cause. And she instead <laughs> thinks about shifting the gear outside of the person. That is through institutional changes, through policies, and so on. And um, what she has done is written uh, a book that she turned in only Tuesday, Tuesday titled What Works, colon. Gender by Design. Lovely title. Please come up and tell us about Thank you very your much. thoughts. <coughs> Thank you very much, uh, Mazarin, for this kind introduction and um, Judy for putting this together. Um, so I might be violating some rules. Um, I'll mainly tell you anecdotes, but I'm also going to share some data with you. Um, so uh, it, also, I should correct, I actually stepped down from the academic deanship, so I'm on sabbatical right now. That's why I could write the book. But I'll um, start by uh, reflecting on my parents' academic dean. So one time I came to the office and had a group of students camped out in front of my office door, um, saying that they needed to see me immediately. And so we met. And they said what I interpreted as saying, that they were concerned about the lack of women on our faculty. And so I talked about faculty hiring, and at Kennedy School we only hire about five people every year, and I did the math, and told them that takes about 180 years to so have equality. <laughs> no, it, it, it is that. Um, but that's actually not the story I wanted to, that's not the main point of the story, because in my discussions I realized that they actually could care less about faculty. They cared about, and I don't know why that's equally important for every department, but they cared about people who they see in the room. And there's lots of fellows at the Kennedy School. There's postdoctoral fellows, there's doctoral students, there's guests, there's celebrities. Um, there's leaders from around the world who speak in our seminars and the forum and other places. And they were really concerned about the fact that they don't see enough women. And that opened a question for me that I don't think anyone at the Kennedy School has ever paid attention to. And that is, thank you. And that opened a question at the Kennedy School to me that, that I think nobody had ever looked at. And that is, 
who is coming through the school? I mean, what is the gender diversity, or generally diversity, but in this particular instance, they were concerned about gender diversity, who speaks at our school? So we have 12 different research centers. They all have their own seminar series. Nobody had ever counted. So some of the advantages of being academic dean is that I could ask the research center directors to report every January to me who, what the breakdown is of all the fellows and all the speakers in any speaking engagement that they have at their um, research institutes. And what we learned, and they learned, was really eye-opening. So you might imagine some of our centers had a breakdown of 90% male speakers, 10% female speakers. The Women in Public Policy program that I direct had the opposite problem. So our breakdown typically is 80% women speakers, 20% female speakers. But it is true, overall, we had about 68% male speakers. I tell you the story because I do think that's an important insight, that counting, measuring what's going on is really important. And I thought it was shameful for me. Not only was I kind of latently working on the book that Mazarin mentioned, um, but I work with data a lot, but it had never occurred to me to think about that question until the students came to me. So there's lots of learning involved, I think, in this whole space for us collectively. When I reflect on the selection process at the Kennedy School for faculty selection, um, and this is now not a scientific statement at all, but I do think one of our most important innovations that precedes me as academic dean was to have an appointments committee. And I presume most of you have that as well, but what they do is to safeguard the rules. So first of all, they had to design the rules, and then they fine-tune them all the time, kind of reviewing our job ads, reviewing how we do things, how, how many interviews does a person have, how long is the job talk, who is the person meeting with, how are we evaluating the person, who have we reached out to. So now we're lots of things that faculty have to submit, faculty committees have to submit, um, where they advertised, who they reached out to, what the applicant pool was, how the final um, uh, selection list compares to the applicant pool, lots of this, this. And I think it actually is very helpful because what it helps us to do is also calibrate across surges. None of us is an expert in this field, neither am I, uh, but it does help to look at various surges comparatively, look at the kind of standards that we apply, where we look, how many people we invite, how many letters of recommendations we ask for. So I do think that was very, very helpful and really guided by Judy's office, um, kind of regularize some of the process. Um, now thirdly, I'm gonna talk a little bit maybe also about, um, about my research, but uh, one study that you probably are familiar with um, that affected me and kind of m might have influenced the fact that I turned from studying trust to studying gender was Claudia Goldin and Cecilia Rouse's work on orchestras um, with the short summary that if you audition behind the curtain as a woman, the likelihood that you, it will advance to the next round is increased by about 50%. So blind auditions was kind of my ideal when I became academic dean, but that's of course not how we normally do things. So I have three slides, um, just kind of to make three points here, or maybe really more two. The first one is um, a slide on interviews. Um, and I'm sure my colleagues will talk about many other things, but all of you probably have job talks and interviews. And I'm gonna suggest that almost everything on this slide is wrong. <laughs> so the first thing that is wrong is we shouldn't do panel interviews. I think they're relatively rare in academia, so I won't spend a lot of time on that, but there's lots of evidence suggesting that groupthink is just gonna emerge when we have panels interviewing people. The other myth that um, surprised me as I was collecting data for the book is that diversity on selection committees doesn't solve the problem. And that is because Mazarin and others have shown us in much work that seeing is believing. If we don't see male kindergarten teachers or female mathematicians, we don't naturally associate those jobs with men or women respectively. And we often find relatively small differences um, in the eyes of the observer. In fact, there's really nice randomized controlled trials, experiments in Spain, where faculty selection committees are uh, created randomly, picked out of a hat um, from across the faculties in Spain. And so what researchers could do was literally analyze what, what difference does diversity make on that selection committee. And they found some surprising results. So for example, what they did find was an outgroup bias for committees evaluating people to promotion to associate professor. What does that mean? Women didn't want to promote other women. It was particularly pronounced for women. Why is that? Because women had some theory that there are, there's gender-specific competition. 
that I'm competing with other women for the 10 slots um, in Spain, and therefore I don't necessarily want to have more like me uh, in my department or even, because this is Spain white, in my um, discipline. It turned to an in-group bias, so that means the more women on the committee, the better for the evaluated women, for promotions to senior professors, so to full professors. At that point, the women were looking for friends. Now they're looking for people like themselves. So there's actually this really interesting and complicated stuff going on in terms of kind of diversity of committees. Now don't take that as me saying diversity on committees is not important. I think it's important for other reasons because we have different networks and reach out to different people. But I have no evidence to say that it is important in the evaluation process. Um, the third thing I'll say about this is, and I mean I'm characterizing obviously uh, uh, here a bit too much, um, what I mentioned before, calibration ag across candidates is really, really important. Obviously, they won't only look at one candidate, I'm sure, but that's something that turned out to be very important for me um, when I became academic dean, and since then, I mean, now as a faculty member, interviewing job candidates. I'm really trying to adhere to that principle that I compare candidates with one another. Um, and I'll, I'll show you in a moment how I do that um, and can in, in a very, very disciplined way. Um, fourthly, that's my last point on interviews, um, they might be using what uh, is called an unstructured interview. And I presume most of you use an unstructured interview. I have always used unstructured interviews. I have to tell you, these are probably the worst predictors of future performance that you could imagine. Um, now, the sad, let me actually very quickly give you one study because it's so important and so relevant for us. So Texas, um, had a turned out to, to run a very interesting experiment because the government of Texas realized in May that they didn't have enough physicians. That was after all the medical schools had chosen their students. So it turned into a natural experiment because then the government of Texas said, you all have to admit 50 more students. So now they had to go back to the pool, go deep into the pool, you know, select people who nobody else wanted. And it turns out, and then what's beautiful, then they could follow those applicants over time and see, did the people who we initially ranked number five and who we admitted, do they do better than the people who we initially ranked number thousand? And I had to admit, just because Texas State made us do so, it turns out, as you might guess, zero correlation. It doesn't matter. And th the beautiful thing is, if you take out the interview score, then the correlation gets a bit more precise. So don't uh, overestimate the interview. Okay. But not that you have to pay attention to this now, but um, so I did actually spend some time to think about um, the research on interviews and how we could structure interviews better. Because I don't think we'll give it up. That is kind of an interesting human bias that many social psychologists have actually been trying to work against for 50 years and we haven't been suc su uh, successful in convincing people that the interview is useless. So I don't think it's gonna go away. So I do think we have to just make it better. And there is evidence suggesting that structured interviews do a much better job than unstructured one. And some key components of a structured interview are you ask the same five question every candidate in the same order. And ideally, afterwards, you force yourself, and that's exactly what I did, to blind yourself as you possibly can to your notes, I mean, to the, to the uh, name of the person, and you compare question by question across the five candidates. Because what you're trying to do is you're trying to protect yourself from what is called the hollow effect. You don't want to be influenced by whether you like the person, or whether the person wore your favorite color, or whether the person even answered the first question really well. You want to be objective uh, across all different questions. Okay, so the very last thing I'm going to say is this, um, and that's become a bit of a passion of mine, and that is, you know, very small details that you might not think of can really matter in this process, including what's on your walls. So I'd invite all of you to go back to your departments and have a look at who is on your walls. So at the Kennedy School, we noticed 10 years ago that we had about 60 portraits um, of leaders, typically public sector, private sector leaders, all of them male, all men. We have 50% female students. We had zero role models for women on our walls. Um, now we've changed that. We've commissioned um, uh, portraits of Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, other um, uh, Edith Stokey, founding mother of the Kennedy School. Um, so we're trying to change that. But go back to your seminar rooms. I've been to some of your seminar rooms. I've been to my seminar room. Some of our seminar rooms have male portraits exclusively. Imagine what it feels like for a person applying to a job and giving a job interview in such an environment. 
Thank you. So our next speaker, when I said the baton has been passed to a new generation, I mean uh, Rowan Flad and, and, and the other young people who've been tenured within the institution recently. Rowan is a uh, John Hudson Professor of Archaeology in the Faculty of Arts and Sciences. Uh, he is in the, I would think, the stones and bones part of anthropology. Is that how, how you think of it? Okay. All right. Um, Rowan's work focuses on the development of complex society during the Neolithic period and the Bronze Age in China. And what that does is it gives him a great perch from which to look at whether the decision making at Harvard University in the 21st century looks a little bit like the Bronze Age in China. Um, he has, he, and then when he notices that, he tells us about it, and, uh, and, and we scurry around trying to fix it. Um, so one of the things that he's looked at are introduction of animals in early Chinese uh, society, their use and sacrifice. Um, he has uh, looked at social change more generally, and there are, I think, comments he's about to make that I find especially compelling in the way in which we identify how our search ought to even be named. So with that, Rowan. Thank you uh, very much, Marjorie, <coughs> excuse me, and, and Judy for inviting me um, today. Uh, I feel a little out of place because I think I have a uh, much shallower and um, uh, more limited experience than the other people in the panel and probably most of the people in the room. But I uh, have been, um, I guess, passionate enough about this issue to get Judy to invite me here today in my limited time uh, in the tenured faculty here, um, partly because I think that the uh, process by which we go about selecting um, new faculty, uh, particularly junior faculty, is very important for the, the entire pipeline into, uh, into our senior faculty. Uh, and it is the way in which we make this institution uh, stronger. Um, partly, uh, my interest has come from an, an egregious lack of diversity in our own department, particularly relative to a field that is a very diverse field, both in terms of gender and other categories. Um, and so uh, that makes me take pause when we're doing searches. Um, and I was uh, fortunate enough to lead a search um, a couple of years ago fortunate or unfortunate enough to lead a search a couple years ago um, during which we, uh, we thought a lot about this issue. And I'm going to mention a few details related to that um, as I go on. Um, but another reason why um, I'm, I've been interested in this issue actually has to do with issues related to implicit bias, um, particularly because of work that my wife has been involved in on, um, on motherhood bias um, in, uh, in hiring practices um, and uh, being exposed to a lot of the literature um, on uh, implicit bias and so forth through that kind of personal connection. Um, and so uh, this is something that I've been sensitive to and, and have wanted to bring to, uh, that sensitivity to some extent to um, the uh, search processes going on in our department. Um, and so I'm going to have three points, three main points. I don't have any slides, but I have three main points that I wanted to make today, one of which probably deserved a little bit of uh, maybe a slide. but um, And they're somewhat. Uh, narrow in terms of their um, uh, their focus, um, partly because I don't have the command of the type of data that um, have been talked about so far, um, nor do I have, feel like I have the depth of experience to speak to it in a, a much bigger institutional sense. But um, perhaps some of the uh, yeah. perhaps some of these uh, points will be relevant to um, other searches that are going to be going on. So the first point is uh, relates to. Um, the kind of general idea of ensuring a rich talent pool for searches that go on. Um, and I think one of the most important components of this is, def is the definition of the job itself, including the, the, uh, the job ad as it's produced. Uh, but more, perhaps even more fundamentally to that, thinking about um, what it is that we should be searching for in our departments when we are able to move forward with a new search, or even when we're requesting that. Um, because I think a tendency, and certainly is the tendency in, in our department, I think in many, is that when we have um, somebody who retires, uh, we want to replace that person. And we think that, first of all, that's a means by uh, a, a reason that the deanery is going to permit us to do a search. Um, and secondly, that if somebody in our department has been a, a major uh, player in uh, the field as a whole through the lens of the work that they do, 
uh, and has impacted the field that perhaps that uh, uh, suggests that that element of the field is particularly important. So the search that I was uh, responsible for chairing a couple of years ago was an example of this, where we had probably the most eminent member, or at least certainly one of the most eminent members of our department retiring. Um, he is somebody who had been um, influential in the field in many ways and had also sat in a position that um, had a long legacy behind it of m almost 100 years of people within that field. Um, uh, changing the way in which we think about the origins of humanity. Um, so clearly, this is an element of the f uh, field of uh, archaeological anthropology that um, has fundamental importance to the way we think about our past um, and the way we understand the development of, uh, of humans. Um, and it's very easy, I think, to, um, to think of just replacing that type of person, whether it be at a junior or senior level. Um, Unfortunately, the field in which uh, that person sat uh, is the most non-diverse, <laughs> or one of the most uh, non-diverse subfields within our discipline. And so um, this presents, I think, a, a, uh, a challenge that is not unique by any means to, um, to anthropology or archaeology. Um, and uh, there are two ways, I think, that we should be thinking about um, at least um, Evaluating that situation when we when we are looking for uh, to to replace people or or uh, move our d departments and our disciplines in d new directions, one of which is whether or not um, there is there has been change in our in our disciplines such that the fields that were most important in the past are no longer the most important or at least can be folded within a broader uh, set of fields. Um, and a second is the way the job ad is, is written and, and structured in such a way, and, and I think that we should be thinking about making, a casting a net as broadly as possible um, and not having um, keywords and phrases within our job descriptions that um, implicitly uh, narrow the field that we're, the fields that we're searching in. Um, <clears throat> uh, so when, in, in, the, in the case that I was involved in, um, this was a, uh, a job that was uh, focused on the Paleolithic in in uh, in, the, in the old world, so every basically outside of the Americas, um, and although the job itself was structured in such a way that um, it really did narrow to some extent the diversity of candidates from which we had applied, we were very conscious of trying to uh, both conduct out outreach and also um, consider non-traditional applicants uh, in terms of that position. Um, so, for example, um, something that we uh, we did was do some outreach to individuals in the field that people knew from one way or another, or uh, who might have uh, ways to get the word out about the job that were not just posting in the same places. But in fact, I don't think we did a good enough job at that. Something that um, has was brought to my attention too late, or you know, actually even after this was finished, was one thing that we probably should have done, and that many people that might be relevant to many of you, is thinking about posting. Uh, job ads in places that are explicitly targeted towards underrepresented groups. Um, so whereas in, in anthropology, one might post a job for the American Anthropological Association or the Society of American uh, Archaeology and other kind of major venues, there are also uh, small focus groups that cater to underrepresented uh, populations within these uh, societies. And I think that we don't often do enough, enough, at least we didn't, um, in terms of specifically targeting such, uh, such groups for the advertisement of, of these sort of jobs. And that's something that we might um, uh, look, one might want to think about. Um, secondly, uh, charging individual faculty within, in the department with uh, not just those on the search committee, but everybody in the department with uh, actively reaching out to people that they know um, with an uh, intention of not just uh, spreading the word, but specifically spreading the word to uh, uh, populations and individuals who may have uh, interesting pa uh, path-breaking, cutting-edge work that doesn't obviously fit into the uh, job description, but nevertheless can be thought of within that way, um, within that, the confines of the job. Um, so that, that's kind of one major set of points, has to do with um, the, uh, uh, the kind of ensuring a rich talent pool. Uh, the second set of points I wanted to make had to do with um, evaluation of candidates. Um, and uh, the, 
I had, this actually, the second and third kind of go together in some, to some extent, but I want to make a couple of points here, um, some of which we adopted in the, in the search that I was involved in, some of which I kind of uh, reflected on later. Um, the, I think that, and, and perhaps this is, the, some of these points are obvious, but I, I think they're worth, uh, worth making explicit. Um, I think it's very important that um, searches do not uh, rely on uh, the individual committee members reading files on their own, ranking candidates, and culling the field down with numerical rankings without any conversations about, um, about the uh, applicants um, to lead things off. And in fact, um, I think that type of process uh, allows for all sorts of implicit biases and other, other um, factors to come into play that are not never explicitly um, made clear and that um, potential, have the real potential for losing interesting candidates who don't obviously uh, fit into what the a narrow way in which the job was initially uh, 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 conceptualized. Um, and so uh, one thing we, we did, and I think is good practice generally, is to, at the very beginning, even though um, most of the committee members had, had done some degree of ranking of candidates on their own and, and thought about what made certain candidates uh, 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 strong or not, we went quickly in the first meeting through every single person and, and talked about whether or not they, uh, you know, what their strengths and weaknesses were. This takes more time than it would if you uh, just simply cut down uh, the candidate pool um, in numerically. And in some fields, I mean, <coughs> ours is not one where we have hundreds of applicants. And, uh, and so I would like to hear from those who are in fields that have so many that it would be, make it really impractical to do this. Uh, nevertheless, I think that this uh, plays an important role uh, in uh, in trying to diversify, uh, in terms of research interests, the, the, um, the pool of, of people who look to be the most strong. Um, secondly, when ranking is uh, 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 done as part of the process, I think it's important to um, have explicit conversations about the various um, aspects of a candidate's um, portfolio that can be ranked differently, um, and also talk as a committee and as a department about which of those are more valued in a particular search. So for example, um, we broke down in this particular search, although not, I must admit, until the, uh, the, the period when we were doing the shortlist, um, the, the, so the ranking of individuals into um, a number of different uh, aspects. Um, the breadth of their work, the depth of their work, the performance that they had in the interview process, uh, their research promise, their teaching, and their fit were the five, were the six categories that we had. And then within those, there were subcategories that I asked people to think about, and particularly to think about how um, they ranked those subcategories in relation to one another. So, for example, um, in terms of research promise, this kind of general category, um, we I, I kind of suggested a number of, of sub components, promise as a researcher, potential impact, demonstrated impact, scope of vision, significance of research, trajectory, relevance, and tenurability at Harvard, which I think is actually a really important uh, category that um, we think about when we're doing hiring, because if uh, we know that the, the process of tenure, of tenure at Harvard has its uh, own quirks and, and characteristics, and we really need to be thinking about um, how it is that we are, 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 how it is we should be hiring people who can be mentored in such a way that they're going to be um, promote, promotable here, um, and so forth. And I can give you similar things for the the, um, the teaching component, which we had many kind of sub sub aspects of and fit as well. Um, if if you're interested in hearing that, um, uh, this is where I might have used a slide, but I'm, I don't have one. Um, the uh, having these kind of subcategories. Uh, focused our discussion about what it was that was really important to us as, as a committee and as, and as the department, so that, such that I don't think it's really possible when you get top, a, a number of good candidates for a job to simply say that this person is better than that person, and, and it almost never is the case that that's true in every regard. In fact, when we ranked our six top candidates, all of whom we brought in for interviews, there was no, no one of them that ranked top in all of, the, all of those categories, as I think is predictable and it would be expected in almost any case. Um, so uh, another thing that I wanted to mention in this respect in terms of evaluation of candidates had to do with um, the sensitivity to the fact that when we have particularly tenure track jobs, we're gonna, we have a, a, a wide range of uh, experience in terms of the applicant pool. Um, we have those who are just finished, those who are you know, a few years out, those who are many years out, oftentimes people who are 10 or 15 or even 20 years out who are applying for junior positions for, for whatever reason. Um, and, uh, it's, I think, a quite, of a, quite a challenge to uh, distinguish what makes 
a strong candidate for a tenure track position uh, uh, here um, of somebody who's been in, in the you know out in the uh, the teaching world for 15 years relative to somebody who's just finishing and maybe has one article or some, something else. Um, and so what we did in this case, and I'm not sure this is necessarily the best best practice. I'd actually be interested to hear um, is uh, I shouldn't say we. This is what I did is I separated out um, these kind of groups of groups of applicants into these kind of age grades, if you will, um, and then thought about, for myself, ranked them individually, and then thought separately about whether or not, uh, you know, what the strengths and weaknesses were of somebody who was, had been in the system for a long time versus somebody who had, was just finishing up. Um, and finally, in this respect, uh, in, in this uh, kind of um, in concerning fair, fair evaluation, I'd mentioned the challenge of international applicants, particularly for junior and tenure track positions. Uh, for a number of reasons, both uh, the, um, and this isn't true with international applicants from every context, but from, uh, but there is a challenge of when we ask for letters of recommendation, the nature of those letters being written by scholars who are, uh, who address that type of um, request in a very different way than what is expected of uh, scholars in North America. Um, and uh, also the expectations that we have in terms of both teaching experience, experience and, um, and communication effectiveness, particularly in the interview process where we're dealing with people and thinking about how effective teachers they may be, um, and, and, that, and sometimes uh, kind of superficial aspects of communication can outweigh other things. Um, and finally, um, the last set of points I wanted to make actually relates a, a bit to what Iris was talking about concerning um, the, 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 the process by which we evaluate uh, candidates. Um, and uh, ensuring, uh, the, the main point here is that I think that it's important to ensure that, this is, that it's a deliberative process. Um, in fact, uh, I'm, I was very interested to hear about the, uh, the fact of, um, of committee meetings and panel interviews being a bad idea. Um, which I think is a really interesting take-home uh, point for myself. I, I have, as an, as an applicant a long time ago, been uh, sort of simultaneously um, uh, subjected to the American system and then the British system, where you do get a, a panel interview um, in, in academic contexts. Um, and I wasn't actually sure which is more effective. In, in many ways, I think that, uh, that at least from kind of an outsider standpoint as an applicant, I, I appreciated the fact that I was asked the, a question once and I could give an answer and then everybody kind of heard the same thing. But I can, on the other side, on the other side of things, the, the group think uh, component of it, I think is very important to think about. Um, and um, uh, the kind of last thing I'll say about this uh, concerns um, the, those who we ask to take part in our, uh, in our committees. Um, and this relates to the point about diversity on, on committees. Um, and. Uh, I think that actually it's quite important to ensure that those who are involved in at least the deliberation process about our applicant pools are not limited to a small group of uh, individuals uh, from the same part, department with more or less the same perspective on what the job, uh, on what a good applicant is. Um, and I think that ways that we uh, should go about ensuring that doesn't uh, happen is by having at least one member from an, an uh, allied field who's involved and invested in our searches, even at the junior level. Um, this always happens at the senior level. But, um, and uh, also in, in involving uh, graduate students in some fashion in the, uh, in the evaluation process. And I know that I, that opinion is not shared by everybody, at least in my department, but, and it may not be shared by everybody in this room. Um, but in fact, in the search that I was uh, a, a, a chair for, the uh, reflections by the graduate students were extremely valuable. They were uh, very effective. Um, uh, they made a very effective points that contributed to our overall decision making process. Um, and in fact, the the order of candidates that they as a group kind of came up with was ended up being the order that uh, was um, decided upon in, at the end of the process, including the person who we ended up hiring. Um, so. Uh, those are kind of a number of scattered thought, uh, thoughts about this, uh, this whole set of questions, um, and I hope some of that is useful. Thanks. So, Ro Ro Rowan's uh, comments uh, lead me to just sort of mention that there are two kinds of conversations we routinely have that you might want to be mindful of. One is the kind of conversation that happens at dinner with the candidate. Right? There are no rules here. You could talk about anything you want to with the candidate. Um, there is a preference amongst us at Harvard to read the New Yorker the day it arrives in our mailboxes. Okay. 
it doesn't mean that all candidates read the New Yorker and that that is the most important thing for us to be discussing with them. Uh, it is important to remember that we're not selecting a friend, that we're selecting a colleague who is great for Harvard and for the department. And those are explicitly to be set aside because left to our own selves, we will veer towards conversations that you know speak about the single malt scotch that gets 98 or 99 out of 100 uh, or the New Yorker. And if you do that, just remember that there is no chance that it can't influence your decision. Okay? So we've thought for a long time that we can then set those things aside. And what we're discovering is that the conscious mind is limited in that capability and that it may not be able to set that aside. So think a little bit before you have your dinner conversations. What do we want to focus on? What kind of work do we want to open up broadly speaking with the candidate so that we can hear her or his comments on those kinds of things. And so don't, don't just wander into them. The second conversation that we have, I think, is more deadly. And that is, as soon as you drop the candidate off at their hotel or whatever, the rest of the committee in the room, in, in the car, will usually say, so what do you think? Right? And that's just something that we do. And I discovered that, the, that there are often two junior people in the back and two senior people in the front, and that the two junior people are listening very intently to what did you think. Uh, the next day when you have to vote, surprise, surprise, we all agree on who we should hire. Isn't that wonderful? So I kind of tried to stop my department from doing some of this chit-chatting uh, about the candidate outside of the, the forum. And to, to my great surprise, in one of the searches where we did this, we discovered that we actually asked people to write down their impressions of the candidate, take notes after every meeting, et cetera, and then send them on to the assistant to the chair. When those are printed out and brought to the faculty, so you see for the first time what your colleagues think about that candidate, all of a sudden, there's very little consensus. But at least, but that's the truth of what we are each thinking. So these are little ways, again, for us to um, bypass the very biases that we might have. Um, the last um, a speaker on this panel um, is somebody I admire greatly, Avi Loeb, who is Frank Baird, Junior Professor of Science in the Department of Astronomy. He's the chair of the department. He's director of the Institute for Theory and Computation within the Center for Astrophysics. And he studies uh, little things like the cosmic dawn, the first stars and the galaxies that emerged, when those first stars and black holes formed, and what effects they have on our young universe. Uh, but what I love about Avi is that he doesn't shirk from thinking hard about the diversity of his field in every way. He writes email and pesters us about think about this or that. He writes books that make astronomy appealing to the general public. And I have a secret desire to do a study with him in which I want to bring people in to think about the cosmic dawn and then show that after having done that thinking for even five minutes, that they will be less prejudiced when they think about inter-ethnic uh, issues. <laughs> but that's a study I'd like to do uh, with him. So welcome. Um, first, I would like to say a few words about my background because it's uh, not very typical. Um, I grew up in a farm um, and I used to collect eggs as a kid. And uh, often, uh, you know, when I'm frustrated in my current work, I think that it might have been more relaxing to go back to those days. Um, <laughs> I think it's off. Is it off? Yeah. Um, and, uh, since I started with very unusual initial conditions and I got to where I am right now, it offers me perspective about what is the right approach to selecting people. Um, and uh, my personal history, which I regard as uh, quite an unusual path from uh, interest in philosophy at a young age to being a scientist right now, an astronomer, uh, teaches me uh, independence in the selection of my research topics, but also diversity in the selection of uh, colleagues. And that's what I'd like to, to discuss today. How to collect matches that will catch fire. So you can think about a matchbox, and uh, it's very difficult to tell in advance whether if you uh, pick a match and uh, rub it against the, the walls of the box, uh, whether it would light up. Uh, and that's a difficult decision in any selection process. And so, um, I would like to um, advocate diversity uh, for a different reason than, than commonly um, argued for, and, and that is that it leads to diversity of ideas. 
and to innovation. Because different types of people with different backgrounds, uh, different genders, uh, think differently about problems and approach them differently in ways that could allow um, uh, breakthroughs and innovation. And this, uh, once uh, there is diversity uh, in the community of people thinking about a problem, there is more likelihood that not all the matches will be duds. Uh, we are all familiar with uh, the phenomena of uh, uh, seeing uh, young people that, let's say, 20 years ago uh, were regarded very highly. They were thought of as geniuses in the field that they work in. And I will not mention names. I can think of very specific examples in my field. Uh, that uh, 20 years later uh, really did not produce much uh, and uh, did not fulfill the expectations uh, and became sort of dead wood uh, in a way. Uh, and the question is, uh, how come uh, other people that uh, went to lesser uh, institutions succeeded so much in advancing the same field? And what was wrong with the selection process? Now, of course, there is um, a random aspect to it, uh, that it's very difficult to forecast uh, the success of individuals. Uh, but there, there are also some systematic trends. Um, and often people try to reproduce themselves. They, they look at the mirror and they like what they see uh, most of the time. Uh, and they therefore like uh, to see themselves replicated in other people. And there is a sense of uh, longevity of the line of research that they promoted for many years if they find a person that looks like them doing the same thing. The problem is that um, that blocks uh, innovation. Uh, and there are many, uh, many he examples in the history of astronomy where the entire astronomical community thought about known truths that cannot be refuted, that must be right. For example, the sun must be made of the same material as the earth, because the earth, after all, was made of the debris left over from the from the sun, so you would think that the sun is made of the same stuff as the Earth. That was very natural to assume. But uh, Cecilia Payne Kopashkin, when she did her PhD, um, almost uh, 90 years ago, uh, she realized that uh, by examining the spectrum of the sun, that it's made, at least the surface of the sun, is made mostly of hydrogen. And she wrote that in her thesis, and she was discouraged uh, to include that in the thesis by Henry Norris Russell, the director of the Princeton University Observatory, who told her that we all know that the composition of the Earth and the Sun are the same. And uh, she was so uh, frightened by this senior person telling her what, what the right thing is that she took it out of her thesis. And a few years down the line, he uh, realized that she was right and admitted that. Eventually, she became uh, the department chair here at Harvard uh, of the astronomy department. She had done the first uh, PhD in astronomy at Harvard uh, Radcliffe. But that's just a good example to show that the mainstream view is not necessarily the correct one. And diversity helps us uh, innovate. Uh, it also reduces uh, the trends that I mentioned before uh, about the self-replication of both research and policy. So if we have a diverse group of colleagues, we're less likely to repeat the mistakes of the past, irrespective of uh, whether these mistakes are in terms of the research we are doing, the truths, that, uh, the, the scientific ideas that we believe in, or policy matters. So I think uh, it's uh, very... Uh, much to our advantage to promote diversity for these reasons. Um, the mistake that is often made, and I've seen it quite a bit among my colleagues, is that when they see a young person, uh, they immediately develop an opinion about this person after hearing, let's say, a talk or speaking with that person, and they maintain a static image of that person. So if at a very young age uh, they thought the person is not very promising, uh, when this person grows and becomes much more prominent, they still maintain their view. They have a static view of that person. And that is convenient because you don't need a lot of information. You just need to develop the initial image and keep it. Uh, the problem with that is that the initial image that you have of a person is often shaped by uh, circumstances. If that person went to school in a place that is not uh, 
doesn't have uh, distinguished scholars, then that person will not get the same education, will not be brought up to the same standards as the rest of the people. And what one should pay attention to instead is to the growth of the person. So looking at the initial conditions where this person came from and looking at the derivative of how fast that person is progressing and developing. That's much more important, but it's more time consuming because it requires you to monitor how a person uh, develops with time. You can't just assign labels that are static to a person. And so uh, one lesson that I've learned is that even if you had a sort of modest impression of uh, a student or a postdoc, uh, you need to keep monitoring what they're doing and later on in their career, when they're coming up for, uh, when they're applying to faculty positions, it's uh, your duty to update your image accordingly. Uh, many people prefer to maintain the image even when presented with new facts because they feel embarrassed admitting that they were wrong. You know, that's a very common uh, tendency of people serving on committees, uh, even grant uh, allocation uh, committees, they would prefer to give the funds to those people that they believed in early on in their career and block those people that they thought are not very promising, even if the evidence shows otherwise, just so that they will not have to admit that those other people are successful. Um, so it's very important to allow images of people to evolve with time and reward growth rather than um, academic ancestry. Uh, and by ancestry, I, I mean initial conditions, who this person worked with for their PhD. We pay a lot of attention to the letter writers and often uh, PhD advisors that are well recognized get much more uh, attention uh, in terms of their uh, recommendations. Um, more on the day-to-day uh, -day side, um, my experience as a department chair and as director of the Institute for Theory and uh, Computation uh, is that uh, it's very important to, to stay practical, to try and find the practical solutions rather than uh, being confrontational uh, with people with whom, uh, with people that don't share your, your, your set of ideas. Uh, because uh, by uh, get, getting into uh, fights over particular issues, uh, by getting confrontational, uh, a lot of energy gets wasted and, and very often those people are blocking other moves uh, towards the right uh, direction. And so uh, what I found to be a strategy that works very well is trying to bring other people um, to explain to them um, uh, why it makes sense to promote diversity. Uh, and to my surprise, I found that the honest, straightforward, non-political approach uh, to be very effective. Um, and uh, I, I, I haven't encountered any resistance from uh, faculty members in my department when I adopted this. Uh, it may well be that they are afraid, that they don't want to uh, express their voice uh, loudly, but I don't care what the reason is. In practice, <laughs> they did cooperate, and I didn't uh, encounter uh, much resistance. And the results are that um, among our students, and I should thank also Dave Charbonneau, who is uh, sitting here from my department, uh, who served on, on many committees that helped promote that. Among our graduate students, 46% uh, are women right now. And uh, from the in incoming class uh, this year, 30%, about a third, are minorities. So that's underrepresented, underrepresented minorities. Uh, at the Institute for Theory and Computation, about 40% of the postdocs are women. And uh, five out of six of my uh, graduate students are women. I didn't do anything special to encourage that. Uh, it just happened. So let me move from this uh, slide, which is more general, more philosophical, to uh, some specific rules which I think uh, are helpful uh, in promoting uh, diversity. And these are my personal uh, rules, guiding principles. Um, the most important guiding principle is that one should maintain a high quality, a high uh, level uh, in the hires. Uh, and there are many reasons for that. Obviously, we all want um, Harvard to be the most prestigious institution, most successful. Uh, but it's also important to realize that if you compromise, that leads to a reinforcement of prejudice. Uh, 
So if one tries to just improve the statistics without maintaining a high level, high uh, threshold um, in terms of qu the quality of the, of the candidates that are recruited, then uh, it goes against uh, the, the goal because uh, it, it says that you know, on the books, perhaps the numbers are uh, promising, the statistics looks good, but, but obviously um, uh, that candidate will encounter difficulties later on, so that's, that's not a good idea. Uh, and the other reason to maintain high uh, quality threshold is to generate uh, role models for other searches. So obviously if there are faculty uh, members that are from a diverse background, um, uh, that helps in uh, um, um, inspiring young people to enter that field and following their footsteps. Um, the other thing that, uh, 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 the other mistake that is often made is to think that uh, organically things will get uh, uh, organized in the right way. Uh, and um, that doesn't seem to be uh, what happens. Uh, leadership does matter. And in that sense, it's very important uh, to select uh, the search committee uh, to include members that, are, that do appreciate the value of, of diversity. Uh, it, it's important to, as, as was discussed before me, uh, to encourage promising women and minority candidates to apply, obviously, uh, and to search for target of opportunity hires. Uh, very often, once you establish uh, a strong reputation for the department or for the group that you're working with, uh, there are potential hires uh, that are lurking out there that might be interested in coming. Uh, and most important, it is to uh, create a constructive atmosphere within the department that is supportive of this, uh, of this process. Um, of course, the candidates that apply uh, do so based on the impression they get from the community at large as to how um, comfortable it is to be within the department with, uh, at Harvard. And as we heard before from uh, Iris, uh, some candidates don't apply because they feel uh, that they're not good enough or perhaps the uh, environment is not nurturing enough. And so in that sense, it's very important to follow up on uh, hires uh, by uh, nurturing academic growth, uh, addressing problems uh, when they are still small, um, and then nominating, for example, um, junior faculty or, or, or postdocs or students to, to prizes and fellowships. It's very important to uh, uh, show that, that we care about the, the less senior people around us. Uh, and that includes also attention to personal needs, uh, which are particularly important. Uh, uh, every individual has uh, her or his uh, needs, uh, and one should pay attention to their special needs. Uh, that includes creating a family-friendly environment uh, that supports families uh, and avoiding uh, overburdening um, women colleagues or, or, um, or minorities with too many committees. Um, and more, an, another important uh, element of all of this is to create a broader impact than just here at Harvard. And, in the astronomy department in particular, uh, I'm very uh, proud, again, to acknowledge work done by uh, John Johnson and, and Dave Charbonneau. Uh, for example, uh, we do have a summer internship program that is promoting diversity. Uh, there is a postdoc program, uh, thanks to Judy, that was established to promote diversity. Uh, there are mentorship opportunities for um, either postdocs or uh, faculty um, to promote diversity, and one can organize workshops. Uh, and all of this is important because it creates an image of Harvard as a place that accepts people from different backgrounds. Uh, a lot of the problems have to do with the fact people don't expect themselves to be uh, accepted to Harvard simply because Harvard has an image which uh, is very uh, selective and very specific. And finally, the, the ultimate goal uh, uh, of everything I do is, is to increase diversity uh, to a th beyond a certain threshold such that um, uh, the environment that I'm embedded in makes decisions in a stable, self-sustained so, so manner. So it, will, it wouldn't matter who the department chair is and who uh, is uh, 
pushing in one direction or another, there would be a large enough number of people, that, of colleagues that care about it, such that the process will be self-sustained. And I think that's the healthy, stable uh, state that we all aspire to be in, so that uh, the issues that we bring up, bring up and discuss today will not have to be discussed in a special forum. It will become self-obvious that uh, this is the reality. That's the way things are. Um, and that's my, my dream for the future. Very much, Avi. Um, so I think this is the rest of our time is to be spent in in discussion with the panel. But also Nina Zipser is here from uh, uh, Mike Smith's office and uh, at the FAS, and uh, Judy's here, and I'm here. So we can consider all all six of us as able to answer different questions that you might have for us. Uh, please mention any struggle that you confront. We have this possible situation. What might we do? Or other thoughts that you have about what is not making sense about what it is that we're saying. Any and all of these uh, are, are uh, we're, we're open to receiving from you. So let's just get started. I see a hand slowly rising. Yes, please. And I just wanted to know whether uh, um, uh, uh, Professor Claudia could say a little more about the problems this panel interviewed. Mm -hmm. um, I, uh, I, I would involve a major revision of uh, the procedure and philosophy to get rid of those, but uh, is that what you do right now in philosophy? Is uh, what you say? Or well, no? if, if I'm understanding what a panel interview is, that is to say several yeah. members of the faculty yes. interview the candidate, that's one of the things that we do, yes. I uh, see. Okay. Uh -huh. uh, I, so didn't, I wasn't aware of that, but yeah, okay. Iris can say something. I'm happy to answer that question. Um, uh, so the evidence suggests that if you have several people interviewing one candidate at the same time, it's very difficult for the three or five panelists to form an independent opinion. Um, and that's just, that's it. So that's the, the crux of group think is that sometimes groups uh, are worse than if I collected people's ratings individually and then just average the five different ratings, for example. Um, so that's, that's the reason why group interviews generally are discouraged. I might add one more thing. If you want to pick a baseball player, would you throw a ball to him once or would you throw it 10 times to get a sampling of how good a baseball player that person is? batter. Uh, I think panels don't allow multiple shots so that you can. And so even though I think that there is one very positive thing about panel interviews, uh, and that is <coughs> that we've all heard the same answer. And now if we disagree about the quality of the answer, we can actually tussle about it. We can say, I think what she meant was X, and you think what she meant was Y. So, we, so there is a small benefit, but I think the disadvantages outweigh uh, most the, the, the merits, yeah. Yes, and then come to you. Um, I was <clears throat> just wondering, uh, in each of your faculty meetings, how many of you have been at a meeting where there was an explicit discussion about implicit bias? Okay, because for us, that was revolutionary, because before then, whenever we talked about diversity, um, I think our faculty naturally viewed it as we we're going to compromise on quality for a socially desirable good. And what the, what the research and what that powerful stuff about implicit bias does, it just breaks that narrative and makes us realize, oh, we're not hiring the very best people. So if there's someone who's excited, if you're excited, you know, I would encourage you to get that discussion going in your faculty. It gives you a completely different way to talk about this goal. Can I, uh, can I just uh, add to that, that it just makes me cringe when any question about quality ever emerges when I uh, show the research I do, because that is so far from what we're actually trying to say that all I'll say is it makes me cringe. Um, the reason I want to just add one more thing is you don't have to know everything about implicit bias, but you have to know one overwhelming fact that there are now not 50, not 500, but 5,000 studies that in one way or another take exactly the same resume, the same product of work, and just change the name. 
okay, to vary in ethnicity, sexuality, nationality, gender, uh, uh, dominant language, whatever, cl social class, uh, all of these. And what we know over and over and over again is that the same product, the same work, is not viewed the same way because of that name. That to me is the single thing that we need to know because we think that we are indeed doing what our job is and that is to attend to competence, to attend to the merit of the work. And what this research is teaching us is that we're not able to do that. We need to find other ways to be able to find out why we're not able to do it and it all boils down, it turns out, to the decision about competence. So the last, the most, the most relevant study to us might be uh, a, a study done by a biologist at Yale who uh, published in PNAS maybe a couple of years ago uh, in which she actually selected people like us, people who are in the life sciences, who run research labs, and she had them select the job, she had people be selected for the job of lab manager. As you all know, lab manager positions are very important. It places the person in that role to getting to a, a much better graduate program than they might have if they had gone straight from college. And what she finds in that study, amongst people like ourselves, is that for exactly the same resume, we, both men and women, over-select men compared to women. We do it because we actually see competence in the male candidate over the female one. And again, I don't mean to harp on gender, it's just the one that's been studied, but this could be something like two, looking at two people, one of whom has a military background and the other who doesn't. And we may have some stereotypes about what people from the military might do to our environment. Those are the kinds of things that we can allow getting in the way. $4,000 more in starting salary given to the same equally qualified male over female. And to me, this is even more stunning, reporting on spending three times as many hours mentoring the candidate if that person is male over female. So once we know this, then the question becomes exactly the one that David is raising, and it's all about how do we get to the, merit, the right, most accurate sense of merit. Um, yes. Um, I had one follow-up question and then one separate one. The, the, the follow-up was with the um, panel interviews. Does the research suggest that the panel interview itself is problematic or just that in comparison with five other individual interviews, it's worse. If if the panel interviews accompanied with the five other individual interviews, mm -hmm. is, is that problematic? What sort of what is the extent of the actual empirical research on, on this? Uh, it's a very good question. I don't have an answer. So I only have an answer to your first. So the typical study has been done with five different separate interviews compared to the five people on a panel. I don't know about sequencing, whether sequencing would be a good thing. So for example, I mean, th this is just now a hunch. I could imagine that having the five separate interviews first, which often actually happens, and then for the five panelists in some way coming together and maybe re-interviewing, I don't know whether that was going to add value or not. I really don't know. I don't know any evidence. Yeah. You know, the problem when you ask is, uh, is the panel interview decent but just not as good as the individual? The problem is that interviews suck. That is the problem. So almost any, so I don't know about doubling up on them to kind of see if we can do more. In a sense, the talk is the panel interview. There is a person presenting the heart of what we want to learn about and we all listen to exactly the same thing. We don't come away with the same things and we don't all listen equally and so on, but at least there is that, that moment where the most important piece, the work, is being viewed by all of us jointly. So I still, based on what I've read, I st and I don't believe that we have the time to do both the individual interviews and then gather again as a group to do a panel uh, interview. So, so far, individual interviews, if, and if you can get your faculty, I mean, look, w you know, it's like herding squirrels, not, not just cats, but it's like to get faculty to do anything systematically is not going to be plausible, really, to say, <laughs> could you ask the following questions? Could you stick to the work? Okay, one of my graduate students just had this happen. She's a, a concert level pianist. She went off to graduate school, got a PhD. Unfortunately, she had had a little line on her, on her CV that talked about her, her music competence and everywhere that she went, faculty asked her, how do I get my kid into Juilliard like you did? Explain to me what happened. So, so the entire hour was spent talking about how, and at the end of the interview, f people felt they had, didn't know anything about her work, which was true. But that was the selection of the questions you ask, uh, hugely important. Right? Yeah, I mean, that's, uh, just to add to that, that's so why you have to have a list of the five questions you want to ask or ten questions, how many questions ever you know you want to ask, and stick to those. I mean, I couldn't just agree more with what Mazarin said. It's so easy to you know go out on a hunch and kind of talk about 
wherever they went on vacation. The other thing I thought was interesting is so Google actually experimented with the optimal number of interviewers. So you, I mean, that's another thing that we're encouraging companies or even departments to actually measure what you're doing yourself and kind of see what works. Now, many of our samples aren't big enough, but Google had the advantage of having a very big sample. Turns out for them, four different interviewers is the optimal number. There's nothing magic in the number four. It might be different for different organizations, but what is magic is that you can use data and you can look at which points are at which point are the scores starting to converge, and then you can save the company lots of money, and you be, can increase your accuracy at the same time. Yeah, I had one other okay. independent question, which was uh, one of the points that came up was that it's best to make searches as broad as possible rather than sort of specialized, narrow specification of the candidate. Um, in my own department, epidemiology, is every search as far back as I can remember has been targeted to a p particular subdiscipline within epidemiology, often to meet what are perceived as the needs of the department. Do you have any further comments on trying to balance the desire for a broad um, search to obtain the, you know, the best possible faculty member across all the areas of a discipline with meeting, say, the departmental teaching needs or um, the need for sort of having diverse representation across the sub-disciplines within a, a department? I, I should say that in our department, we have a tradition of uh, having open searches, not even defining the area uh, not to speak about defining a narrow area. Um, and it has worked extremely well because, um, for example, I was hired in a search that was uh, or conceived as a search for an observer, and I'm a theorist. And vice versa, we have uh, observers that were hired when the department really needed a theorist. The advantage of having it more open is that, um, well, first of all, obviously, uh, you are open to a, a more diverse pool of, of candidates, but uh, also the level of excellence that you can recruit is, is, is far better because uh, it's not at all guaranteed that in, in a given year the, the applicants will be of the top quality in the particular narrow area. So we're not just talking about the number of people working in that area, but also in this particular year, whether there is an exceptional uh, candidate. And so I think it serves a department well to be as open as possible to candidates in a wide range of fields such that, uh, and, 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 and such that the th quality threshold would be very high. Rowan, do you have something to I say? Mean, about I couldn't that? agree more with what Avi just said, uh, um, but this is based kind of on my and generalized perception of the way that um, uh, that fields, broad fields, are improved. And I think that if you, I mean, if the the, the real need in the narrow field eventually trumps everything else, most likely you're going to get the the best applicants in that field anyway. If the if the broader definition incorporates that uh, that narrow one, and but you will also have the opportunity to look at um, uh, creative uh, applicants or you know uh, um, unusual applicants that you would never would have seen had it not been for a broader um, definition. So you know uh, our view of great men and great women is so strong that when one of them leaves, we're willing to give up searches in our own area to fill that position with somebody like them. The more admired they are, the, the more that is likely uh, to happen. And I think Rowan gave a great example uh, of that. So I do like the idea of saying, this is the kind of person we think we need. Now let's go to one level above that, to a slightly more prototypic level, uh, rather than the subordinate level of that field, and to specify, yes, it's a little more work because you will get more applications. But the biggest reason to do it is because our minds about our own fields changes slower than the actuality of those fields changing. And so what you get is an infusion of something you never even imagined or that you did not know about. And so I like going into a search not being prepared for what I'm going to see and leaving explicitly some open space for being able to shift gears. And this is where the chair of a search can play a very important role. And there's no reason to say we're looking for X, so we must hire X if Y ends up being uh, somebody who is non-canonical, but ends up being perhaps the kind of person who could change the future. And because we're a school that has much smaller departments than many other schools do, for us, every one of those people people being able to do more than one thing tends to be appreciated. Yeah. Can I add one other thing? I, I think that there's been an interesting procedural change here, as I understand it, in the last year, such that um, uh, now there's an extra step in terms of the uh, approval of search committees. 
Um, and as I understand it, then uh, job descriptions are being asked for and before a committee is actually formed, which means that this conversation, if that's true, if I'm, if I'm understanding this accurately, that means that this conversation about the nature of a job request needs to happen before the job de definition takes place, but rather when a, when a request to the deans is being made. So I think that we should all take that to heart, that when we're in the academic plans and so forth, and when we're re requesting job searches for the following academic year, we need. I, I think we should be thinking about how to define what it is that we're requesting as broadly as possible to incorporate the perceived needs and yet permit this kind of broader uh, definition to be used in the job ad. Yes. Just yesterday, we had a spirited discussion between the heads of two different search committees, one in molecular and cellular biology and one in FAS systems biology, uh, over the utility of using Skype panel interviews, so the panel part we've talked about. But the, the, the Skype aspect is you get to a point where you have 25 people on your long list and you're trying to get down to six or eight people on your interview list. And uh, whether or not to use a brief Skype interview of about 30 minutes with three people to try to narrow that list down and get a little bit more information. And the two points of view are basically, on the one side, when we bring people in for a two-day interview, People feel that they often know within the first hour whether this person is going to be a good match, and so why waste the two days? And the other point of view, which is probably obvious in this room, is that a short Skype interview seems to be rife for problematic judgments about somebody's photogenicness more than the substance of their, of their work. Um, and maybe just from the way I said that, you'll know what side I was on. Uh, but, but I'm interested in people's views on this, because we do have a problem. MCB, for example, is one of these areas where we get 200 or more applications, and we have to winnow those down to a, a manageable number to, to interview, and, and whether, whether or not to use these brief Skype-like things to, um, to winnow it down. There must be data from phone interviews, maybe not from Skype interviews, and I'd like to know if that data is out there. Um. So, yes, there, there is some data, and um, one of the books that I recommend to you, which I think is the best book that has ever, ever been written in human resource management, is written by not a human resource manager, by uh, Mr. Bock, who is um, chairing a HR department in Google. And again, they've experimented, measured everything. Um, and I, sadly, it comes down to what Mazarin said before, that generally the added value of any interview is very, very small. So for them, whether it was Skype or in person actually didn't matter. Whether it's 10 minutes or half an hour, it didn't matter. Structured interviews added validity. Um, but I think the really important message is we're just generally bad in judging people. Um, and we should replace the value that we attribute to whether a Skype interview or a personal interview with as objective measurements um, of performance as we possibly can. Now, I'd like to add just a footnote here and I, I'm sure you have been in those situations too. Um, sometimes interviews don't even serve the purpose to predict future performance, but actually to sell Harvard, right? And I think that's a very different perspective. That sometimes you kind of you also part of the discussion that I often have. So I have my structured interview, and then the last ten minutes are for me to talk about the Kennedy School. And I think that's an opportunity for us to kind of also sell our place. So, so, so interviews do have a place, maybe in particular, I think, in that realm. So interviews do give us unique information that is not in the CV, no question about that. They even give us very useful information, but they also give us a lot of crud. The question is how to, and that's why overall, they are less good than only making decisions from CVs, uh, as, as many meta-analyses have now shown, because it's that other stuff. So if we can figure out better ways to interview. So to answer your question about Skype, I would say that human beings will use any shred of evidence that they can find to make a decision. So in the old days, we used to have people attach photographs to their applications. But then things would happen, like at Yale in the 40s, where somebody said, reason for rejecting the candidate, he has a Mediterranean nose. That was sufficient to in indicate to a colleague that this application should go into a different pile than the good pile, whatever. We got rid of photographs. Um, and now, of course, because of Facebook and Skype and all of that, they're, they're back. Um, and if we had time, I could show you, independent of gender, race, anything, it turns out that we have fundamentally wrong views about what certain facial features tell us about the psychology of the person. 
about their competence. Turns out if somebody has eyes that are a little closer to each other than average, you will think they're dumber than they actually are, or certainly compared to the same person with the eyes a little bit wide set. So I'd be very skeptical of, of facial data, which is something that makes interviews go wrong. And so what's the solution? In my mind, we can't get rid of them, so my solution is a little bit of harder work on our part, and that is read, read, read the work before you bring the candidate in. We're having this discussion in psychology. Many of my colleagues would like us to bring a whole series of people through in our brown bags and just think about their work. And I'm arguing uh, to Max, who chairs that committee, no, let's just read the work, and when we know what, how we feel about the work, let's for the first time see the person. Uh, and then maybe our conscious minds will be able to actually do some good work to, to say, no, okay, that person is obese, but that doesn't mean that we don't want them here. That's the kind of work we can do if, if left to us. A few more questions, yeah. Other thoughts? Yes. So this, um, I think it picks up a little bit on, on a previous question. In trying to understand any of the particular risks that arise when you're conducting open brain searches, mm -hmm. um, because from one perspective, that's a great way of maximizing the potential diversity of the, of the candidate pool but it introduces some obvious challenges, especially if you think that the, say, gender diversity or racial diversity of the candidate pool has improved over time. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, you might have a sort of racially, relatively racially diverse tenure track pool that the tenure people that you're comparing them to are not so diverse, um, but they're also by definition more accomplished. And so how, I mean, how, do, how do you work through and mitigate some of the um, biases that might say something about how the how how yeah. University Hall and uh, so is thinking we, about this. We attract often, as you know, um, people ask us to authorize open searches, and we budget them as senior because they are almost always come back as senior searches. So we just have become careful to do that so that our budget doesn't kind of go out of out of whack. So my um, suggestion is actually to have them run a tenure track search and then really canvas the field. And if that's not working for a while, or if there is someone that, you know, if then in canvassing the field they find there are, uh, there is a diverse pool of senior candidates and they're very strong, then you might consider it. But I find open, like we just chuckle when we put open down and we say, okay, we're authorizing an open search because we know it's gonna come back senior. So that's really the answer, according to the data. But look, we are at supposedly now a, a university that will be tenuring from within. Um, if that is the case, then I think it's very important for us n not to think that the default search can ever be a senior search, uh, but that instead our job is to conduct a junior search. Now this obviously doesn't mean that if there's some demigoddess out there that we shouldn't go and get her even though she's senior. That's not what we're saying. But I think that if we really want to make the kinds of changes we do and to really have the greatest opportunity to promote from within, that, that I, I, I just don't see uh, us making a case for senior searches very easily. Uh, other questions, other thoughts? Um, Judy, anything you'd like to say? About you wanna close or I'll you close. wanna, okay, then I'm happy. Why don't I just close this out by thanking our panelists, thanking Mazarin, and most importantly, actually thanking all of you for being here. Um, I think that uh, your presence here signals a lot about the potential future of Harvard. Some of the questions that are coming up about panel interviews, about Skype interviews, about reading the work, that's actually one of my favorite questions to ask at an ad hoc tenure review. Have you read the work? And I'm amazed at the number of people who uh, actually admit that they have not read the work. Um, so I, I think that that kind of message is an important one to get out. The other is that this is not the last time. We have lots of resources that can help you. If you're in the Faculty of Arts and Sciences, uh, Nina Zipser, who's sitting here in the gray jacket, and Mazarin Banaji uh, are more than happy to talk with you. If you're in the Faculty of Arts and Sciences or anywhere else at the university, I and my colleague Elizabeth Ankarana in the back of the room there are more than happy to talk to you. We'd wrap, we held this event early in September, even though we know this is an incredibly busy time, because we'd rather 
talk to you before you get underway, then as, we're happy to talk to you along the way as well. So uh, please feel free to shoot an email uh, or make a phone call, but we're happy to brainstorm with you. What you're hearing here is in some areas there's a lot of research that we can point to, uh, and in some cases it's a lot of craft knowledge. Um, and the craft knowledge can often be as important as the research in terms of experiences in difficult situations. So I hope you all feel free to reach out to any of us, I dare say our panelists, but uh, I think talking to colleagues who are in the same positions as you can, can be very valuable, which is why we asked uh, Iris Rowan and uh, Avi to uh, be the panelists here. So. Uh, we're running a little bit over, so let me just say thank you all, and I hope, honestly, to hear from each and every one of you, uh, because I think that would be uh, the best outcome of this event. So I wish you all the best of luck on your committees and with the rest of the academic year. Thanks a lot. <laughs>